I saw a line from one of your books that said, um, everywhere you go to ask an economic question, you get a climate change answer. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah. So my 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 last book had one chapter out of ten about climate change, and and, and the, the more the more into Europe you go, the more people say, why aren't there nine chapters? And absolutely right, it is the existential problem. Even more now, since 20, since October twenty eighteen, since the IPCC report, the urgency is much more real. We it, we need to sort, we need to decarbonize the world substantially by by twenty thirty. Okay. To uh, to. If David Attenborough knows what the problems are and what the solutions are, I don't need to write a book about it. You see what I mean? Uh, I want to write a book about the thing that people are not realizing. That's why I've focused so heavily on questions of, of human nature, of human agency, and the threat to it. But the political program I have is one of where we combine the urgent need to solve the problems of market economy because if we can throw money into these poor communities, such as the one I come from, Lee in Lancashire, 65% uh, leave voting, uh, biggest problem, domestic violence, uh, zero hours contract, seven pound an hour wages, that's it. That's the life in Lee. Shops, there's more shops, in, uh, independent shops in Hay than there are in Lee, a bigger town. If, we're gonna, if we can throw some resource and money at them, and change the economic model in a way that becomes much more human focused, breaking up big tech, uh, providing new models of platform cooperatives and mutuals and non-profits and wiki style businesses. I think we can, we can take those pop populations on the journey they need to go on. Because the journey they need to go on is the rapid transition beyond carbon. And, and right now, some of them are on the uh, reverse journey. You know, the Brexit party, I don't get too political here, but the Brexit party is full of people from the fossil industry and climate deniers. And fine, because I, want to have a, I don't want to slag off climate deniers. I want to, like with the man on the street, I want to actually debate them over the, over the, the actual evidence. But it's quite possible. Labour candidates in East London, what are they terrified of? London just Im imposed a... A, cli a new climate levy on, on um, diesel uh, vans. To be fair, a lot of quite poor and quite precarious male uh, self-employed people who live right out in, in, the, in Essex and you know, kind of places like that, e east of London, are terrified. You know, they, they, are, they are outraged at, the, at this new levy. They say, well, how is it, how, what am I supposed to do? You know, my job is white van man, and, and yet, no, this is a tax on white van man to save the planet. Well. You know, screw that. We need a way of taking them with us. And I think we need a narrative that is strong towards the goal. So, so that's how my ideas here fit into the, the piece that is climate change. I'm not a climate scientist. I haven't focused over, overwhelmingly on climate in my career. Other people who are more expert than me can make that case and I will support them. My bit of this project is to create a progressive alliance of people that can have the arguments and create the, the narrative that takes those communities where they need to go. Um, yeah, on the algorithms and our mind, for want of a better catchphrase, um, my three top tips would be for us to retain and own our own data, yep. for us to embed more mindfulness and meditation and awareness into our society and cultures, and particularly children. What would be your two or three takeaways for how we can actually address the issue? So, in the book, what I argue is that, again, following Alistair McIntyre, that... If you, let's say there's four schools of, 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 as it were, moral philosophy. There's, there's Aristotelian virtue ethics. There's Nietzsche, fuck you, just shoot people in the face and laugh about it. Uh, and anybody who thinks he doesn't say that, you know, that's, that's there. Um, <laughs> but the two most popular ones, in, in, the two most popular ones are, uni, are utilitarianism and, and, and social justice, you know, deontological sort of ethical lists. And, and, and McIntyre argues really that in our era, it's, the, it's Nietzsche versus Aristotle. And, and so for me, I buy that. I, I buy the idea that what we need is a virtue ethics, a concept of the eudaimonic life and community and society at the level of the whole human race, and a concept of a new set of virtues. Foucault wrote seven, a piss take of St. Francis of Sales, Foucault wrote a seven, seven bullet point list of virtues for the postmodern era. I, I, I want to move away from them. I want, I want us to, to re, and I think everybody just does it themselves, 
ask yourself, what is virtuous at a time when fascism is, is coming? Well, we have good, good role models in the anti-fascist generation, Anne Frank, Orwell, uh, Levy, ha Arendt herself. So to, to, my tip is, I only one tip, have a conversation with yourself and your peers about what, is, what, is, what kind of person is needed to create the good society. And I think that's the conversation that neoliberalism eradicated. I'll, I'll give, I mean, to, in the neoliberal era, we've, we spent a lot of time performing to criteria. So how many lesbians and gays are we employing in this company? A lot, tick. Black people, tick. Women on the board, tick. Uh, we've given to, you know, we, we've staged a, a cleanup of a local beach, tick. There was no tick box for and I believe it all. <laughs> and as a result, we find out that a lot of people are sitting there ticking the box going, really believing that black people are subordinate to white people, that women, should, you know, the all alpha male, beta male women thing among the American far right is frightening, that women should, you know, be, alphas should get pretty girlfriends, betas should get everybody else, and women should put up with it. That's, that, if you have a teenager on an Xbox or a PlayStation and they use the voice channels to play the games, ask them if they've ever heard that said to them. You'd be very surprised that they all have. That's the theory, that's, it's the glue that sticks together, the new far right. So, so my answer to you is, is to have a conversation about virtue, unpopular though it is in some social science department. Thank you very much for your talk, very good. Uh, I think what I, if, if I can take from it, uh, if I understand it correctly, you're quite optimistic, I think, in one way about what is, is actually going to happen in the end. Um, my question is about the available alternatives that are out there. Um, the disintegration of the centre-left in Europe has been a feature mm. since the financial crisis. I'm a member of the Irish Labour Party myself, which would have been centre-left for many years. You, and again, if I pick up your point correctly, you talked about part of the solution being the creation of a coalition between the left and the centre, yeah. which we would have, and the social democratic movement in Europe, would have always have seen themselves as. Among the available alternatives out there, who do you see as best reflecting, in part of political terms, in Europe, your, your effective okay, philosophy? Good. My role models in politics are people like Ada Colau, who may today just be kicked out of the mayor of, being the mayor of Barcelona. But what she's done, she was a housing activist, been arrested, became mayor. She, she, she had to rule in coalition with the socialists, so she immediately had to forget the, the radical half of her policies. Um, and she's no in trouble because she didn't support Catalan independence. And she's probably going to be kicked out by radical left Catalanists. So, you know, the, what goes around comes around and, and there are problems. But Ada Colau did this. She said the data of the city is a public good. So Cisco, Accenture, all the contracts we signed with you where you were going to get the data in return for some shitty um, wires and, and boxes. No, we are going to keep the data and we're going to discuss public common ownership models for the, for the data. By the way, here's a local assembly. Colau speaks to this size meetings every day of local people. And, and unlike, say, even great left politicians like Corbyn, she actually listens to them and she, I, she I've got your point, yeah, I come and see you. There's that level of engagement. And they handed digital democracy to people. So anybody can suggest a law. You need 30,000 signatures and out of about 120,000 gets it gets the spending. They allocated spend to the, to the internet decided democracy. I think that's the future. That's taking people, I, I hope she will win today. And I, that, it's that, and I think my frustration with left politics and of course centrist politics is it remains at, this, at the emotionally unintelligent level at the moment, both lots of it, but we're all to blame. And we're all stuck in this. If you lose an election, you see it tonight. You have to stand up and say, "Well, we won really morally." <laughs> you, 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 you can't you can't base a narrative on lies. And I'm afraid a lot of politics is still at the lying phase. Arendt, Arendt said a horribly true thing. She said, "When the Nazis said German society can no longer guarantee your security, your prosperity, they were lying the truth. That's what they did." And 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 so so many of the demagogues who will win tonight in Europe are lying the truth. Um, that we, we need a way of guaranteeing security and prosperity for everybody, otherwise the right will, will convince people that they can. Just a personal question, are you, do you feel you are optimistic? Yeah, 300,000 300, years ago, plus or minus 50,000 years, we invented stone tools, okay, or, or, or even beyond that. 
we, there's a certain kind of stone tool that begins then. 10,000, 12,000 years ago, pottery. Um, 2,500 years ago, democracy. 200 years ago, steam engines. Um, last year, a silicon chip, four nanometers thick, uh, with a trillion switches on it. There's more switches in this room on your mobile phone, I would imagine, than the number of analog switches ever created by electro electrical engineering in the world. Three billion each, work it out. That's how many switches are on your phone. The machines in, you have access to are incredible. Now, if you stand back and look at that historic, you know, kind of thing, you say, well, they're going to do something good, these guys. You know, they're, 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 they're motoring, actually. Um, we're also destroying the planet at the same exponential rate. You look at the cores drilled out of the Antarctic. You can see how exponentially bad the climate situation is going to be. But my optimism is we can get into whether there are technological fixes for climate. The fix for climate is human behavior, a mass transformation of human behavior in 10 to 15 to 20 years. We can do it. Uh, but the source of optimism also lies in, in what I observe about the transformation of human beings. Those of you who know my work, if you look at the work, work I've done around 2011 on the networked individual, you know, I think the, 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 the rising human capital of, of the networked individual in, in, in de democratic societies is something that's very hard to put back in a box. The sociologist Manuel Castells from, from Barcelona says, you know, you can't de-electrify a country. You can't de-network a population. So I'm optimistic for that reason. As far as I see your view on future of technology, you yeah. could do as well in the context of Bakunin as one of Marx's. Uh, context of Bakunin, yes. Yep. Um, in a post-scarcity society where we all have access to incredible and powerful education, why do you think we need a group of elites to tell us what way of living our lives is correct? I'd like to hear a strong and transparent justification for the need of, us, of uh, the state in a post-scarcity society um, Property is theft. I, well, look, I, I, there is no justification for a, a, a state as we know it in a, in a society that has rel almost halfway to abundance, let, let alone complete post scarcity. Um, I think I am best known on the sort of radical left for saying that the state must be the enabler of that transition. That is the capitalist bourgeois state that we have with its institutions now. So that instead of building from the bottom up, uh, with our co-ops and our uh, non-profit banks and our ethical banks and credit unions and organic collect collaborative farms, we, we need the state to do two things. It needs to clear a space for those projects. It, that means suppressing business models that don't fit with the future, outlawing some business models like Uber, uh, taxing uh, offshore, tax, uh, ta offshore money to bring capital and, and providing sources of capital to those businesses. I don't think you can do that without the state. And therefore, one of the most radical things you can do is just elect a, a government that is, wants to do that. At the other end of it, my vision is for a hierarchy-free and a state-free society. So Mikhail Bakunin, the, the, the Russian anarchist uh, thinker, is, you know, I mean, I'm a huge critic of Marx. There's more critique of Marx in my book than there is of, of pro-Marx. Um, there's also a chapter called Reject the Thoughts of Xi Jinping, which will go down fantastically well in Beijing. Uh, <laughs> but not that kind of state, in other words. But I, no, I, I, there is no justification for a state. But then you, what the, the real question for me, and it's more dealt with in post-capitalism, to be honest, is the back half of that transition. How do we manage? See, I'm all in favor of a universal basic income, now provided by the state. But in order to, to shrink the market sector, shrink the state sector of the economy, in order to allow a flourishing non-market, non-state sector, a wiki sector. In that situation, eventually, the money for the basic income runs out. and We have to find non-remunerative forms of human interaction that, that provide services. Uh, I think we'll, all production will be automated. And we need to learn how to live a highly culturally, cons how to consume culture and create culture. I see, I see the billion pounds spent by the Arts Council triple that and you've got, you've got a huge motor for non-market production and consumption of culture. So that's the, the near term is a kind of radical social democracy. The far term is what the people still alive in the back end of the 21st century want to make it. I won't be. Uh, and, and they'll have to survive uh, climate chaos if we get this wrong. Finish on one thing. The re the, the, if I'm right, the real crunch comes in persuading people, governments, and institutions now, today, to do things that seem wrong. 
We need to borrow a lot of money and use it to decarbonize the economy. We might have to print money to pay for some of that borrowing. So it seems awful, but you print the money, you buy the debt, you bury it. And the back half of the 20th century, 21st century will have to deal with that. But if we don't do it, they'll have to deal with the sea being sort of up here in hay. And I'd much prefer the problems to be fiscal and monetary problems than drowning. So thank you. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.